Hey everybody, Lee with LG Speed and Custom, and in this video, we are replacing this crusty cowl patch with this brand new cowl vent. In the last video on the 32, we painted the firewall. My pal Christian from Headlines Pinstriping pinstriped it all up. We've got it. It's just sitting on there right now. It's not bolted down. And the reason it's not bolted down is because we still need to use the firewall to get this shape back. In this video, we are going to be replacing this big, ugly patch. So when I bought this car, uh, Thomas that sold it to me said that in the 60s, this was a drag car. And I'm assuming that this was probably cut out for maybe a blower or some injection stacks. I don't know. I don't know the history on where it was raced or what was in it for an engine. He said, actually, I think he said it had a Hemi in it, but I don't have anything to back that up. No pictures or anything like that. But we got to fix this because one, it's kind of ugly. Two, it is like an inch too short. And three, I really like cowl vents. They're the best. It's like air conditioning for your feet. A nice hot day, you -tunk, pop the cowl vent open, kick your shoes off, and oh, it's riveting. I've got this replacement panel from Brookville. Uh, I made the mistake of just ordering this before I looked to see how much it was, and it was expensive. This was like a $700 piece by the time I got it shipped to my door. It is a pretty nice looking piece though, and I think it will definitely fix everything that we need to fix. So I think the first thing we gotta do is, this looks like part of the windshield frame here, or windshield recess, whatever you wanna call it. So I think we need to actually take the windshield frame out, which is something that I've been meaning to do for a while, especially when we were stripping the paint, but I was, I got lazy. So now we're gonna pull it out that's what we'll start this video off with. Windshield frame removal. I've already gone ahead and cleaned all the stuff out of the car. I've been using it kind of as a storage shed the whole time we've been working on it. So to get this frame out, we've got to, we had to undo these guys right here. We've got to take those out and we've got some screws up here. This one looks like a Phillips. That one's a slotted screw. And then two slotted screws over here. If we take these off, then the hinge will slide out. Well, every single screw was different. We had one 5 16 nut and one metric nut, but you know what? Everything came out super easy. No strip screws, no drilling, no rust, no crust. It's beautiful, stoked. So I'd like to overlap this just to fit it and then we can get it right in the happy spot and weld it in. But I need to get it to sit flat on there first and this is not allowing that to happen. So I think we're going to kind of cut part of this out just enough that we can get this to sit where it needs to sit. I'm not sure how I'm gonna tackle this yet because this edge does look a little bit different than this one. So we might weld it just before that. You wanna like, weld it in a spot where it's easy to get to so that we can plenish it after and have the minimal amount of distortion. Originally, before I got the windshield out, I was thinking it was great. It would go right, wrap right around and we would only have to weld it on each side. But this shape here is totally different than this. And I don't know if that's because this is like the uh, sedan cowl and maybe this is made for a roadster cowl. I don't know if 32 Roadster is enough to know, but I know that a 32 Roadster and a 32 three-window cowls are kind of different. So 
Maybe it's also just because this is just a reproduction stamp piece, and sometimes reproduction stamp pieces don't fit like original. So either way, we'll figure it out, but we'll start with removing that. So I think, I think I'm going to cut this like right there and then remove this piece here because like I was saying, it's a totally different shape. And if I cut that off, then we can get this to lay flat and then I can like splice them together, you know, kind of like that. And this bottom area is nice and flat and easy to get to. So we can come through here and access the back side or the yeah, the back side and the top side and hammer it out as we weld it so that we don't get uh, or we get minimal distortion and minimal warping. I think that's my plan. I don't know if it'll work, but I think it will. That's the important part. Well, I cut this off. I tried to film it for you guys, but somebody called me right when I started cutting and it interrupted the record thing. So it didn't record. I had to trim a little bit more off. And now, look at that. That sits nice and flat. We've got a vice grip in place here. I think our next step is maybe we'll put a couple tech screws to hold it in place. I use tech screws the same as lots of people use Clecos. I don't know what the advantage of a Cleco over a tech screw is. They both, you get a, a Cleco, you got to drill a hole and then put it in, whereas a tech screw drills the hole and puts it in. So, I mean, at the end, you're still, still got a hole. So I just use tech screws instead of Clecos. But yeah, we'll screw this thing down. And then once it's screwed down, we can Cut it out and weld it in. I almost forgot the reason that we never bolted the firewall to the chassis yet is because I wanted to fit it to make sure that this curvature was okay and that you know this wasn't bowed in too much or the cowl pushed in like if this is pushed in it's gonna put more of a crown in there and I think we're I think we're okay I can live with that can make that work so and that looks so good <laughs> I love it all right now we can cut it out and weld it in tomorrow because it's the end of the day today okay welcome back day two we're gonna weld this thing in now so my preferred method for this kind of work is TIG and the reason I like TIG welding over MIG welding on a situation like this is a TIG weld provides a soft, malleable weld, meaning as you weld it, you can then come back over that weld with a hammer and dolly and hammer your weld out. So when you weld a panel in, it gets hot. And obviously it gets hot. And when sheet metal gets hot, it shrinks. The shrinking is what causes the warpage and the distortion. So when you weld it and it shrinks, if you take a hammer and dolly and hit that metal again, it will stretch it back out. So you can hammer a TIG weld and stretch the shrunk area back to its original state and eliminate your warping. So a MIG weld is 
when you squeeze the trigger on your MIG welder, it just blasts heat right in there and you let go and it cools down really quick. And that causes a brittle weld. You can hammer that weld a little bit, but it's really prone to cracking. So that's why I prefer a TIG weld is because you can just get, you can, you can work the panel after. Uh, what we're gonna do is we've got two tools for cutting here. We've got a zip disc with a really thin, this is, I can't, I don't know how thick it is, 0 0.04 of an inch, really thin. And this thin guy here, we can put it right on the edge there and just go zip right through and make just the smallest little cut ever. I usually use this in hard to get spots or in a situation like this, we don't have any cuts at all, no lines yet. So we'll use this to start the cut and then I'll switch to the air saw. And I like the air saw because once again, it provides a very, very minimal incision, a thin, thin, thin gap. The thinner the gap you have, the less chance of warping you have because the less weld you have to put in there and the less weld you have to put in, the less heat you're gonna make. This air saw, I just use regular old fashioned hacksaw blades and I just cut them up into like little three inch strips. So I think on that note, we can probably get started. I think I'm gonna start right in the middle here. Probably make a little incision. Continue on with the air saw. Do maybe like a four inch strip. And then what we'll do is right now our panels are like this. So when we cut it, they're going to be like that and we can push them like that and then weld them to get a nice flush fit. So if we do like a four inch incision, that'll give us enough room that we can separate the, the discarded pieces. Like we've got, you know, a one inch strip on the inside that we're going to get rid of. So we got enough room that we can, you know, get in there and flush these guys up, give it a tack and move along. When we get the whole thing kind of tacked in place, then we'll start welding it up. All right, let's get in here and make our first cut. So I just want enough of an incision that I can get in here with the air saw now. Keep going. Okay, so we've cut from about here to here. I don't know if you can see on the camera here, but that's where we did the zip disc. And then you can see where we switched to the air saw, how much thinner that gap is. So that's why I like the air saw. Now, if we come to this level, if I take my thumb and I'm gonna push on the bottom of this, you can see they flush right up. So we're gonna move that up so that it's flush and then give it a tack weld. Cool, a little tack in there. And now, oh, we got a little bit of contamination in there. We'll worry about that later. It's flush right here. I might give it another little tack there. And continue this way out to the edge and then we'll continue on around.
Well, that worked out really well. We're nice and flush all the way around. We've got minimal distortion. This area right here has a little bit of a dip in it. So I think before we start welding, I might take the hammer and dolly and try to just bump this up a little bit. This side over here had some residual damage. I'm assuming probably from when this piece was welded in, just a little bit of warpage or who knows, who knows. But you can see there was a high spot here and it was a little warped here. So what I did is on the areas that were good, I would like get it in place. And then I just came along with the hammer and dolly and worked not this panel, but this panel here until it lined up again. And then as it would line up, I'd tack it and keep moving along. So it's not, you know, 110%, but it's a good 95% and I can live with that. Once we start welding this in, we can hammer it and work it a little bit more. The more time you spend on this, the better it's gonna get. Okay, we're gonna start welding this in now. So from this tack to here, I think I'm just gonna weld that solid. And then right after I finish welding it, well, it's still nice and hot. We're gonna take this crown on this dolly here, put it underneath, and then take the hammer on top and we're gonna hammer that weld out. This is, I think called hammer welding, technically called hammer welding. I don't know, it's something that uh, I just kind of figured out on my own. So where's our filler rod? Here it is. Just sharpen the tungsten. So we'll go ahead and weld that up and then hammer it out. I got the TIG torch set at 200 amps. However, I'm hardly giving any pedal to it. Just, just enough to melt the rod. Okay. So this is doing two things. It is hammering or stretching our weld back out. Actually, how many things is it doing? I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Okay, we're, uh, this is doing two things. It is stretching our weld back into place and it is also hammering our weld a little bit flatter so we have less to have to grind later. All right, let's do from here to here now. You can see where it dipped in. We'll bring that right back up. Beautiful. All right, and then just like before, we're gonna work our way all the way around. Well, that turned out great. This is nice and smooth, hardly any warpage at all. Remember that dip that we had? I pounded that up just a little bit before I welded it and it is great. This damage that's in here is like completely gone now. So that's a win. I think our next step is we're gonna grind this down now, grind the weld down. So to grind this down, I've got a fresh 36 grit on the little 90 degree here. Sometimes I will take like a disc like this. I got some fatter ones and I'll use that just to knock the top of the weld off. I do that a lot with MIG welds. 
However, because we hammer welded this, this weld is so flat already that I'm gonna skip that step and go right with this. So when you're grinding a weld down, what you wanna do is exactly that, grind the weld down. What you do not wanna do is grind your sheet metal thin. So what I focus on is just staying on the weld only and I try not to touch each side of the weld at all because what will happen is you'll grind your sheet metal like as you're grinding a weld if you're digging into the sheet metal as well you're going to be grinding that down too and it's going to get thin 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 and eventually you'll blow through so always avoid that you know what i will use this however for grinding in here because obviously this isn't going to get in there very well so let's do it air moss huh I'll show you what I mean here by not touching the sides. I mean, obviously you're gonna touch the sides a little bit. It's kind of inevitable. But yeah, we're just grinding on the weld itself and not the sides. All right, we just went over it with the 36 grit and it worked out really nice. I am very, very, very pleased with this. So the next step, I'm not even gonna plenish it because it really doesn't even need to be plenished. Like I'm fine with that. I don't know if I can get it any better with a plenishing hammer. So my next step is I'm gonna go over it again with some 80 grit just to kind of knock down some of the sanding or the grinding scratches in here. So I cleaned it up with some 80 grit like you just saw and then I went over it again with some 80 grit on the DA and here is our end result. I think that turned out great. It is hardly any distortion at all which I'm really happy about. So I think the Calvent patch is done. However, we're not completely done yet because we still have to replace this little piece. I think this is like eighth inch. It's basically like an eighth inch C channel that runs along there. So we'll make that next and then once that is in there, then we'll trim this to the same height as that. Not quite sure how I'm gonna build this yet. I'm gonna take a 10 minute break here and figure that out. But in the meantime, woo, look at that. Cool. All right, so my 10 minute break turned into a six day break because I got hungry during my break. And when I get hungry, all productivity ends. But on that break, I figured out how to make this piece. This piece that goes in here. So here's what the piece looks like. It comes up here, cross, and then this is the very front edge. Like right in here, and it's pretty thick. So I was thinking like, do I, you know, make it out of two pieces? Cause I don't think my shrink or stretcher would stretch that. And then I thought of this, look at that. This I can easily make out of this piece of one inch square tubing. It's the same thickness and this is, it's one inch. So what I'm gonna do is cut this along here and cut it along there to get that same profile. And then I'm hoping that it'll be thin enough, or not thin enough, but uh, 
I should be able to like hopefully maybe shape it over my knee or something just to get this curve. The other thought I had, if that doesn't work, if it doesn't want to move, is I can bump it in the shot press, put a little bit of a curve in it. And if that doesn't work, we can take another piece over to my friend Ken's machine shop and he's got a tubing roller there. We can roll the piece through there to get that curve and then cut the profile out after. That's probably the best way to do it, but that also involves me having to go to somebody else's shop and use their tools. And I'd rather just, you know, I'm already here. I'm in the zone. Let's just try it here first. So that's what we're gonna do. Makes sense? Makes sense. Well, that worked out pretty good. That's how much of a bow that we got to put in it. I gave it a quick little try over my knee like I was talking about earlier and that's not gonna happen. So we'll try the press. So to press this, I'm actually gonna put it through the press kind of upside down and that way the press can push down on it like this. So what I've done is I just cut some of these out and these are, they're a little bit more of a radius than what this is and that is to compensate for a little bit of spring back. So I'm gonna make a little, basically a die that I can press that piece into. So our inside diameter on here is three quarters of an inch. I don't have any three quarter inch material in stock and my plasma table can't cut three quarter inch anyways, but I can cut three quarter inch pieces out and I'll tack them together. Woo, those are still really warm. I'll tack them together and then that will give me, you know, a nice little die that can sit in there like that. And then our press will come down and we'll just kind of run it along on there. It might take a little bit, kind of the same, same concept as doing like a reverse eye spring like we did on the, the front suspension on this but I think it'll work I think it's gonna work great well, I got this piece welded together so I said that I cut three out but I test fit it in here and three won't fit in there so I just welded two together but that worked out okay because the third one I just used as the base to hold it upright so we'll put this in the press now and this will sit lay on top of there and we can just run it along and keep pushing down. I'll probably, maybe I'll mark a grid on here, like, you know, every inch or so, put a line so that we can kind of push in a, you know, some sort of systematic way. Hey, we're all set up here. We've got a grid marked on there. So I don't know, we'll give it a couple of pumps and see what happens. I made this a couple inches bigger than it needed to be in case we can't get the ends quite right. We can, you know, get our curve come in here and then just cut the ends off. So we'll see it or try it and see what happens. Doing a little bit of pressure. I don't know how easy this will move or not and I'd hate to bend it too far. But I think it's working. I can see a bow starting. We'll give it one pass and see where we're at.
Okay, well that's working. Definitely getting some curve into it. I think I'll run it through again. And this time, instead of pushing on the line, I'm gonna push in between the lines just to kind of even it out a little bit. And I think maybe one or two more passes and we will be there. I gave it one more pass and we're right on the money now. I got it sitting on the firewall. This is where, like when this is welded to the cowl, this is where it's gonna sit, is right there. And it fits really nice there. So, I mean, I'm happy with that. I think we can trim our ends now and we'll weld it in. All right, we're trimmed to shape. This fits the firewall like perfect. So if it's a little bit out, I'm gonna say that that is this instead of this. And that's okay because we can pull this into this shape because we don't want this piece to fit this shape. We want this piece to fit the firewall because that's where it's gonna sit. Boom. What do you think of that, Lux? <laughs> he doesn't care. I'm happy with how this fits in here now. So well, let's get ready to weld it in. I'm gonna drill a couple holes through the top of here so that we can spot weld it as well as obviously it's going to get welded on there and we're also going to paint this inside channel and paint the underside of this with some weld through primer this is like a copper zinc coating and when you spray it on there you can weld these together and this doesn't burn off and the reason we want to use this is because we've got bare metal in there and bare metal here and as soon as we weld that together, there's no way that you'll ever be able to get paint in there. So it's just a little uh, preventative thing to kind of reduce corrosion. So we'll give that a coat and I'm gonna pop this windshield out real quick so that we don't get overspray on it. Give this a little coat underneath. And now we'll drill, I don't know, maybe every two or three inches or so. like that.
There we go. Cal vent repair done. That turned out beautiful. I am so happy with it. And also very exciting part. This was the, the big push for this repair right here was because now the body can go back on this piece. I wouldn't, you know, obviously we could do this with it on the car, but it would be very, 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 very difficult. So now that this is done, the rest of the metal work, I can pick away at with the body on there, which will be nice because as you can see, we've got a full shop and this is taking up a lot of real estate. So if we can take this and put it on there, we've got all this room to work now. So I don't know how carried away I'm gonna get on the rest of the metal work. Uh, last Saturday when I was working on this six days ago and I got hungry, I was too lazy to keep going on that because I was hungry. So I did an easy job and I took all this lumber out that used to be in the roof insert. And you know what? None of that was even like screwed in or nailed in or nothing. It was literally just like wedged in there and basically a press fit. So that was easy to get out. And with that out, I kind of picked away at a little bit of these dents. So we'll work a little more on them. Uh, like I said, I don't know how carried away I'm going to get on the metal work at this point, because my main goal is to just get this car back on the road so I can start driving it again. And stuff like, you know, the door skins that it needs, you know, I can, you know, one day if I'm bored, I'll just pull the door off and we'll do a door skin and then put the door back on drive it for the next weekend. So that's kind of my approach on this or how I'm going to tackle it. So the next video, we're going to put this body on that frame. So make sure you subscribe so that you know exactly when that video comes out. And as always, you know, if you really want to support this channel, please check out lgspeedcustom.com and get some LG Speed and Custom merch. Huge thank you to everybody that stops by the website and buys you know, we got shirts, stickers, hot rod parts, everything. Like stickers, they're, I think, three bucks for a sticker. You know, all those little three dollars, they help. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, anyways, that's it for this video. That's how you put a cowl vent in a 32 Ford. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys on the next video.